a murder in the Smoky Mountains put a man on death row for 31 years, but did they get the right man? Is Gary Sutton really the killer? Well, an old girlfriend not only rekindled their relationship, she lit a flame under this case. Fox 17 News' Dennis Ferrier has been investigating this case for months, and he has our report. The case against Gary Sutton was never strong. There isn't even a motive. But now, 31 years later, the case is even weaker, thanks to the love of a woman and the work of a private detective. Carolyn Miller and Gary Sutton were boyfriend and girlfriend in 1992. There was talk of marriage. But then something happened that changed everything. Gary's best friend, Tommy Griffin, was shot to death. The victim's sister, Connie Branham, was burned alive at a different location. Gary Sutton and his uncle, James Dellinger, were charged with the double murder. Two shotgun shells found at the Tommy Griffin murder scene Matt shells found at Dellinger's home. A witness heard the shots near the Griffin murder. Another witness placed Dellinger's white truck fleeing the scene where Connie Branham was burned alive. Even then, there was no real evidence against Gary Sutton except the fact he spent a lot of time with his uncle. After his conviction, Carolyn Miller moved on to a new life. But then when she heard on the news Gary was coming up for an execution date, she felt the need to contact him. When I talked to him, it was just like all these things came rushing back in, and I knew it was, it was just the Gary that I've always known. And so I just started doing research. That led to the hiring of private detective Heather Cohen, who started re-interviewing witnesses and looking at evidence. At the root of this whole story, it is a love story. It's a story of a woman that never stopped loving a man who was conv convicted for a crime that he didn't commit. And she is th the reason we're here today. And this reinvestigation all starts at a crime scene at the foot of the Smokies. The moment police discover a murder scene, it is the most critical moment. They have to cordon off everything and start searching, and not a normal search. We're talking about every square inch of the entire scene because the hope is there's going to be something there, important evidence that tells you something about the murder. Well, in Tommy Griffin's case, guess what? That evidence showed up days later. According to the family, it's this crime scene photograph featuring two shotgun shells lying perfectly side by side. Look at this, perfectly side by side. Recently, an avid hunter who happens to be a house representative in the state of Tennessee said to me, that's what got my attention because it's impossible. He said, I took one look at that photo and I said, impossible. There's no way shotgun shells are going to just land side by side. Then there are the witnesses. Barbara Jones saw a white truck fleeing from the scene of Connie Branham's car fire murder. Her testimony placed the defendant's truck at the scene. But to this day, she says she never identified the truck, that they showed her the defendant's truck before they showed her a photo lineup of trucks. And then when they took me in and when they had me up on the witness stand, they had a board that had a bunch of trucks on it and had that picture, that truck they just showed me outside, and that was the only picture on there that looked similar to it. But is that the truck that I saw that day? I can't say that for sure. And it is important to know that an alternate suspect, a violent felon named Lester Johnson, who is now dead, also drove a white Dodge truck. Enter Tina Hartman. We caught up with her in Owensboro, Kentucky, finally ready to tell her story. Lester Johnson was charged with cutting her throat in a shower. He ended up walking from those charges, and Hartman fled the area. Two of the witnesses in his trial did not show up. Murder victims Tommy Griffin and Connie Branham. They called my grandmother after shooting up her house and burning her barn. They told her, you tell Tina that she's next after Connie and Tommy. They had already not showed up for court. He gets out on February the 21st, 1992. That afternoon, Tommy Griffin went missing. Tina Hartman's story has never been told, and it is not part of the Sutton murder conviction. There's more. Way too much for one story. Disgraced medical examiner Charles Harlan was a key witness for the prosecution, 
And another witness says an important part of his testimony was omitted because it would have hurt the prosecution's case. The prosecutor even said back in court in 1992 there was no evidence against Sutton that if he tried him separately from his uncle, they would have to drop charges. Quote, Your Honor, we'll have to turn Sutton loose. Unquote. And while friends and family have always maintained Gary Sutton's innocence, loudly and often, now three state lawmakers and a state senator are going to the governor after a two-hour meeting with Detective Cohen. They're asking Governor Lee for a stay of execution and a full review of the case. He's already lost 30 years of his life for a crime that he did not commit. And I think that we, uh, the people, should stand up and let our voices be heard to the governor, that this is what we are demanding for Gary Sutton and that the governor um, should do the right thing and give this man what's left of his life. Ooh. Dennis Ferry, you're here with us right now. Uh, oh. Dennis, I, there's a lot of twists and turns yeah. to ask about in this particular case. The thing I want to ask you about is we see these things happen across the country all the time. Why? Why do the DAs from 40, sometimes 50 years ago, in this case 30 years ago, seem to get it so wrong? Well, there are times I, it would seem like what, when you get blinders on and you're just going to go down a certain path, and they don't want to deviate off that path. They don't want to deviate off that path. And we've seen that time and time. Adam Brasil up in Grundy County. Mm -hmm. This man was as innocent as us. He was a UPS driver. He never even had a speeding ticket. He had red hair. They put him in a lineup. Someone said it might be him. He went to jail for murder for 12 years. He had nothing to do with that yeah. because they decided. And even at when his exonerate, you know, he was exonerated and given a million dollars. That DA came to the hearing to speak against and said, we got the right man. Hmm. There was just never like, oh, my gosh. And it's so hard for a lot of men <laughs> to say, I'm wrong. I made a mistake. Let's yeah. stop this right now so, and let him go. So and in this case, it's multiple small pieces of evidence. Right. It's hard to follow. But when you if you watch it two or three times or read the online story, you see like, gosh, there's I mean, beyond a reasonable doubt. Really? Yeah. What's next? Well, we're going to do another. Well, we're going to. Well, it's going to the governor because of those lawmakers. Cohen got a two-hour audience. That private right, detective, right. right? So it goes to the governor. We're going to look at the five thing, the five pieces of evidence. I'm going to do a follow-up. Okay. And just hone down into those five evidentiary problems and let people just kind of absorb that and think like, do you do you really want to kill a guy with this yeah. much doubt? Yeah. Right? right. And it's like you know, per, we did Purvis Payne last year, and you know he's. It pulled him off death row. Much more to come. We'll be right back.